Hello everyone, I'm Mark Hunter, and today I am joined by David Wither of Sofant Technologies, and you're watching the Business Spotlight. Uh, David, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, all the, uh, You're uh, speaking to us all the way from uh, Malmo in Sweden as well, so David, thank you very much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks Mark for having me, I appreciate it. Ah, oh, no problem, no problem at all. Um, David, uh, can you tell us and uh, tell the audience then, please, a little bit about yourself and uh, your business as well, Sofant Technologies? Yeah, sure. So, um, David Wither, I'm the CEO of Sofant. I joined Sofant in the middle of 2016, so uh, coming up on my eighth year with the company now. Uh, Sofant is my third early stage wireless technology business that I've run as, as CEO, but it's the fourth early stage wireless technology company that I have been involved with. Uh, the first one was a U.S.-based semiconductor company, and I set up their European operations in 1999 in the U.K. So I've been on this side of the Atlantic since I originally grew up in, in the U.S., studied engineering, um, and had quite a diverse career before I went off into the entrepreneurial uh, onto the entrepreneurial track. Um, so I've been, as I said, an entrepreneur now in early stage wireless technology since 2004, so nearly 20, uh, 20 years uh, in, in on this path. Um, and so Sofant uh, Technologies is based in Edinburgh. Um, it was originally spun out of the University of Edinburgh where its, its core technology was developed. We're developing a technology which is referred to as um, RF MEMS, so that's Radio Frequency Microelectromechanical System. Uh, so MEMS device, I'm speaking to you over a MEMS microphone right now. So um, that that technology is quite mature in industry. Um, you know, if you turn your mobile phone and the screen shifts, that's also an, what's called an accelerometer. So there are several applications for MEMS. Uh, in industry, but it's still relatively unexplored in the area of wireless. So there are a couple of companies globally that are doing uh, MEMS for wireless technology, but but what attracted to me to Sofant was how Sofant's MEMS, or if MEMS technology could be applied to make beam forming antennas. Now, what does that mean? So we're developing a, a phased array antenna and a phased array antenna is a type of antenna that you need um, to point a radio signal electronically point a radio signal in a specific direction. Uh, so the MEMS gives us several significant advantages, but pr primarily um, it dramatically reduces power consumption. So these types of antenna systems uh, consume a lot of power. And if they consume a lot of power, they generate a lot of heat. So then you've got to find a way uh, to dissipate that heat um, through large and heavy heat sinks, or you have to use you know, active cooling systems. And what I mean by that is just fans or some type of air conditioning systems. So that was what originally uh, attracted me to the technology before I joined the company. I called a, a colleague, an ex-colleague of mine, somebody I've known 25 years, who happens to be an expert in this field. Uh, his name is Victor Steele. He's, he's working with SoFan today. And it was really during those calls with Vic that he and I realized that Sofan had a technology which would be disruptive for the future of wireless communication. So, so um, I joined the business and he joined not long after that. And we recruited um, two years later, recruited another uh, one of my ex-colleagues, a guy named Andrew Christie's our VP of engineering. So we've been working quite diligently to commercialize this technology since then. It's been a very long journey. I think, um, uh, you know, these these types of technologies, uh, especially semiconductor based technologies, which you have to develop a kind of a process, a manufacturing process from scratch, take a long time. Yeah. But it has super big benefits. Last year, we announced a deal with um, Inmarsat uh, to develop an aircraft mounted satellite communications antenna. Um, and since we signed that agreement, uh, MRSAT was acquired by Viasat, which is another large satellite operator. So the combined MRSAT Viasat entity uh, controls globally more than 50% of the in flight connectivity market. So if you're getting Wi Fi on a plane, um, it's coming over a satellite link. Um, and that satellite, uh, the antenna that sits on the top of the airplane, um, today is, is what's called a mechanically steered antenna but the market is transitioning to phased array antennas. 
Uh, so this deal with Viasat is quite important for us for several reasons. One, as I said, they're market leader, um, a, you know, greater than 50% market share globally. Uh, but in addition to that, the air in-flight connectivity market, the antennas for that market, is the single largest market in terms of value. Uh, so that market, uh, as, as a standalone, is worth in excess of a billion dollars, projected to be worth in excess of a billion dollars. So, so for you know, from very humble beginnings as a university spin out, I think SoFont uh, has a real potential uh, to be a major disruptor uh, in this market, uh, and and we expect to in the future exploit the same technology beyond uh, satellite connectivity uh, into terrestrial applications. So, so as we go. As we go up in frequency, you need these types of phased array antennas. And as I indicated earlier, conventional technologies consume a lot of power, generate a lot of heat, and, and our technology approach helps to avoid that. So it's been been a long journey uh, so far, but it, we're really just beginning. We're launching our first product uh, early next year. Um, so it is a very exciting exciting time for the company. Yeah, it does. It does sound like it. Yeah, very exciting time. And that brings me to my next question then. Um, as a disruptor into the uh, into technology business, then um, what what's the next five years? How does that look like then for um for this technology, but and also for Sofant Technologies then? Yeah. So today we are twenty nine people, um, and so the company's still relatively modest in size, um, and we're pre revenue. So in five years' time, uh, if you look out in five years' time, our expectation is that we'll be generating in excess of a hundred million dollars per year in revenue. So we do see very strong growth path um, in in the near foreseeable future uh, for the business, and obviously. That type of growth will also uh, drive growth in our business. So we expect our company, you know, within five years' time, to be close to to 100 staff. Um, the majority of those staff are going to be very highly skilled. Um, you know, most of them with engineering degrees. We have a high number of our current employees uh, have PhDs. Uh, so it is a, a really a kind of a deep tech. Uh, business uh, with which which was, has strong um, requirements for highly skilled uh, employees. So so we do see the next five years as as something which will bring a lot of growth uh, for the business. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more many more challenges along that path. Uh, but but it, you know also within that time frame we expect to once we've established our market entry strategy really is built around the satellite communications market uh, we will start to develop our first millimeter wave what we call millimeter wave is just a high frequency radio uh, uh, system we'll start to develop our first systems for terrestrial communications so that's for kind of next generation wireless networks for 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 terrestrial applications so, so we do see this uh, technology, you know, in that five-year time frame, starting to have a real serious impact on the satellite communications market. I think we'll start to, uh, will we be at that point in time? I think we'll, we we will be coming a dominant player um, in the mobile satellite connectivity market, uh, but then we will also start to expand the business for terrestrial comms. Uh, so, so it's it's going to be a exciting five years. Yeah, sound, sounds like it. Sounds like it. And uh, yeah, you've heard it first right here. SoFant Technologies, they're going to disrupt the industry. And that's a great thing. Love it. We love a disruptor, <laughs> don't we? Yeah, they, exactly. they, disruptors change businesses, you know, they change or they change the landscape of a certain industry. So without a doubt. Uh, so, yeah. Um, keep your, yeah, and I think, keep your I think you know, I think what, what, you know, if you look at historically where the satellite market has come from, right? I mean, you know, we had essentially satellite uh, for commercial applications, right? It originally started uh, for communicating with ships at feet, right? Because you, you, you were far away from anything, right? So I think the original satellite communications networks were, were set up for comms at sea. Uh, but then the first real consumer applications were broadcast, sat, you know, TV broadcast to the house, right? So everybody had a little satellite dish on the side of their house. And then we, you know, depending on how old you are, you may remember some of the early adopters having really big satellite dishes out in a yard. To a point, and over time, you know, this the market evolved and you had these small 
uh, satellites, dishes that were kind of bolted to the side of the house. Well, now we see people going to streaming, right? So that's that's changing. And and satellite um, is is the you know they're start the the revenues from that broadcast market are starting to drop, but they now start to see opportunity. Satellite operators start to see opportunity for real growth in communications. So if you want to talk about disruption, we can look at Starlink, right? So within our industry, we have Starlink, which is um, an Elon Musk business, and he's launched what he's called as a low Earth orbit satellite network. Um, and he's selling a service with a phased array antenna. So again, very similar type of technology that we're developing. <clears throat> and that he's been a real disruptor in the satellite market. So what, what the satellite market now realizes they have to do is they have to transition to the type of technology that Sofan has developed. Um, so it's, it's actually, although um, it may seem initially kind of scary that they would disrupt us, actually, um, Starlink has been a real gift for us because what it's forcing the incumbent satellite network operators to do is realize, wow, we do need this flat panel or phased array antenna technology, and we need to move to this as quickly as possible. So it, so the timing, I think, for our business is also quite good. And I think you, you need you need a bit of luck and you need a good bit of good market timing to to be a real disruptor. And I, I think the, the stars appear as though they're aligning for the company. Yeah, sounds like it. Sounds like it. Um, I'd like to maybe... Uh move away a little bit from the industrial and technology side of uh, SoFan and maybe ask a couple of things um, about running a business, being the CEO of SoFan then. Um, so um, as a CEO then, um, how how does the, again, kind of go back to that previous question about, you know, how's the next five years look then? Um, what sort of uh, challenges uh, do you sort of face as a CEO then on top of all this amazing work that you guys are doing, what challenges does that bring as a business owner then or CEO? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I think one of the things that um, is interesting to me about kind of a general management role, right? I mean, cause that's essentially CEO is kind of a, the general manager of the business, right? Is that there is a broad a range of things that you need that you're involved in on a daily basis. So rarely is any, day one day the same as the next i mean so i have quite a quite a varied role there's a lot of different things uh that i need to think about um so we talked a bit about the technology and, and the technology development piece that's been a long journey uh that requires very specialist engineers um but as we start to transition from the kind of r d phase you know from the r phase from the research phase into the development phase there's a lot of implied things that a company needs to do, a company like this, right? And we're we're in the electronics industry, uh, so we need to start to think about building out our supply chain. So who are going to be the key, um, key players that supply us the components uh, and the various, um, you know, bits that we need to build these satellite systems? So two years ago, we, we hired a... A guy named Gary Morton to run our um, operations group. And, and Gary's done a fantastic job uh, helping to start to develop our supplier base. Uh, so we have suppliers primarily in Europe, uh, but we do have suppliers in, in, in the Far East. Um, and we have local manufacturers in Scotland as well. So we actually have um, largely European supply chain, but we do have suppliers as, 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 you know, in Taiwan and in, in China as well. So that's a big challenge, right? So we need to be able to, there's a bit of a sales job, especially in the early days you have to do to suppliers because they're very busy. They have, you know, they have to make an investment in us, right? As a new technology, as a new company, they have to kind of believe in us uh, to dedicate their uh, time and effort to supporting us in the development of our technology. So, so that's been, uh, that's a big part of the journey. And now, you know, we go from building, you know, one offs and two offs to 10 offs to hundreds off to thousands off. And so as you start to transition like that, there's a lot of management and time and effort that's required on the supply side. Mm -hmm. And as we grow the business, then you also need to think about, okay, are we getting the best deal we can on purchasing, you know, all of these materials. So you used to have to start to think about who are the skills that we bring in. Those are special skills guys that buy things, right? So we start to think about how does that work? Right. So, 
What about our quality? What about the reliability of our products? You know, these products are going to be used on commercial aircraft, the very high quality standards. So we really need to think about how do we develop that that product? So then you start to turn towards the customers, right? Uh, of course, you got to start with a customer. Nothing starts without demand from the market, right? And I think that we're very customer oriented in our business. Um, but but I'm just kind of talking you through the transition of how how the business evolves and 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 kind of the timing of when you need to bring in the various skill sets to scale a business like this. Yeah. So right now I primarily handle all the sales and business development for the company because we're really we we, we don't really have a product to sell yet. We have prototypes of that product. We're doing testing in that, but this fall we'll start to ship our first prototypes to customers that they'll start testing on their networks. So now we need to start thinking about bringing in people that are more product focused. So we got to develop all the all the materials that you need, all the manuals that tell you how to use the equipment, how to install the equipment, how to operate the equipment, um, how does the equipment specified, right? So you've got to bring in people that are more product focused and think about how do we launch this product? What's the material? How do we market the product? How do we raise our profile in the industry so people come to us and, and inquire about buying that product, right? And then, and then, of course, as you start to move the product in the market, you need to start thinking about how do you sell and distribute that technology, right? So now you need to start to build out uh, the sales and distribution side of the business. So, so in the industry, um, you know, historically in the satellite industry, a lot of uh, sales have been done through channel partners, right? So distribution networks. So guys that are what they call value-added manufacturers or value-added resellers. So the people that made um, the satellite terminals or dishes for your house, the guys that made those didn't install them. They they sold that to a local install installation company, right? And that installation company came out and installed that technology in your house. So so those are the types of relationships we need to start to, to develop on the customer side. And then, of course, you've got direct customer relationships. So, so in our case, that'll be the satellite network operators directly. So we need to make sure that we've got people that are selling and servicing to those customers, making sure we're capturing not only their current requirements, but what are their future requirements. Um, and so, so there's quite a bit that needs to be done. So, you know, you're building, you're building out. And as, as I talk to each one of those kind of functional disciplines, there's a lot of impl implications about the types of people you recruit that fill those roles, the type of experience they have. Do they have need to have specific industry experience in that role? Or you can get somebody who's got maybe relevant experience uh, with transferable skills from another industry. And that's really important because when you talk about one of the challenges that we have as a business, especially over the next five years, it really is growing the organization with the right type of people. Because ultimately, um, although I say we're a very customer-focused organization, our success is 100% uh, built on the, on, you know, through through collaboration and teamwork in the, in the employee, with the employees, right? So our employees really... Um, are are really the backbone uh, of the business. They they are why you know why we're able to be successful and how we're able to grow and and, and develop uh, as an organization. So so I think getting the right people into a company, especially in the early stages, is very very critical. So there 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 are several aspects, several challenges that we're going to work on over the next five years to build out that organization um, to serve our customers because that's really what we're here for. Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent agree with what you said there. Uh, getting the right people uh, it certainly makes a massive difference uh, for, in the positive uh, way of helping my business grow, helping your customers, as you said there. Um, and over the last couple of years, um, I've, sp I've spoke to a lot of business owners, getting the right people can be quite a bit of a challenge um, with uh, with recruitment. You know, um, how have you over the years? You know, you've been, you've you've managed a couple of companies now. How um, how have you overcome that that barrier, that that challenge, that struggle of getting the right people on board, um, for your businesses? Then, yeah, I mean, i i, I tend to i uh, I, t I tend to go back to the well many times, right? So if I've had a good experience with an individual. Um, you know, when I get a new opportunity, I'll give them a call, say, hey, where are you available? When would you be available? So I think, you know, I, I, I tend to um, 
you know, in the first order, try to find folks that I've worked with before uh, if they're available. Again, this is what I'm talking about building a core team, right? I mean, I think, you know, when you get beyond that, there's, there's, you can't do that, obviously. You can't just, you know, take your employee base every time you move and just move them to a new company. It's not possible, but um, it is probably not a good idea either. But, but, you know, there are a handful of individuals that, that again, since I've been in the same industry for 20 years, right? 24 years, 25 years, there's a lot of folks I know in this industry. So, and, and, you know, there are skill sets that are quite rare in our industry. So those are the people that I, I you know, I'll, I'll make calls to. But I think beyond that, what's really important is to have something that's compelling, right? What is the, what's the company about? What is the, what is the, what is the opportunity for an individual to come to your business uh, to have an impact? And, and I've been, you know, I've worked for very large companies and organizations, but for the last 25 years, I've been working with smaller companies and I, I, I prefer it. Um, but there is, it does take a unique skill set, right? And it does take people who like a challenge. Um, it takes people who want to have an impact. So the kind of people that we're looking for, or we look for, um, are people not necessarily that have the exact skills that we need, um, but have maybe the right educational background or maybe some stuff that's transferable from another industry. But primarily what we look for is people that are good fit for our organization, that they'll fit in with. The, 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 we're like a tribe, right? You know, you, 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 you know, and you think about a family, right? You don't always get along with your family members, but families function, you know, as, as a family unit, you know, we function as a, you know, kind of a tribe, right? We have a very diverse set of employees from all over the world, even though we're a small company. But we share a common, um, you know, a few common traits. And one, we like challenges. Uh, two, we want to have an impact, right? We don't want to hide. You know, in a big corporate, you can hide in the fifth cubicle down the hall and nobody knows what you've done that day, right? I mean, it's very common in these bigger companies or bigger organizations where individuals can kind of hide, right? They don't, they're not necessarily really productive. Those are not the kind of people we look for. Uh, and those are not the kind of people that thrive in these environments because they are uh, quite high pressure environments at times. Uh, and they're, they're environments where your skill sets are very much highlighted, right? Or if you make a mistake, you know, everybody sees it. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's that's not for everybody. But fortunately for us, I think certainly, you know, in, in my experience, you you know, if you have a really interesting opportunity, uh, you can create an opportunity for an individual. You find people that are, you know, that are trustworthy, uh, that that want to be part of something special, want to have an impact, um, you know, then they and they're the ones that that create the foundation on which we build the business. Now, there's a time at which, you know, you, you, sometimes you just kind of have to. You can't be so selective, especially in really in a hyperscale mode. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you need to really put you need to be as selective as possible, especially in the early days. So it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to find people like that. It is one of our biggest challenges. Right. It's one of our biggest challenges. Yeah. So, oh, so we work our networks. We work with recruiters. We do what we have to do to, you know, to get the word out about the company and make it as attractive as possible. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what I was about to say is, is yeah, a lot of people are experienced in that, you know. Um, but I think what you've given us there is uh, anyone watching this, uh, looking at re recruiting, you know, um, I think you've given us some very good advice there. So uh, thank you very much for that, then, David. Um, I've got just a couple more questions. Um, I was just wondering then, um, what have you learned or what's been your biggest learning as a CEO uh, or you know, working so, for so many different companies uh, and being a leader, you know, what, what's been your biggest learning about yourself then during that time? Yeah, about myself. That's a good one. Um, you, you know, I, I think, you know, you, you have to, you have to learn how to kind of take the good with the bad, right? I think when you're in an early stage technology business, it's a roller coaster. Um, so what I've tried to do is, is kind of objectively look at my behavior, look at how I'm reacting to situations and then kind of, and then and question, 
you know, why, why are you so happy right now? Or why are you so sad? <laughs> because, uh, you know, the thing about these early stage tech companies is one day you feel like you're on the top of the world. You've just had a great conversation with a customer. You feel like you're going to, you know, you know, you're, you're, you're going to really reach all your goals and, 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 and your ambitions. And then the next day you'll, you'll have a call with a supplier and there's a serious quality problem and you realize you're not going to be able to deliver or, you know, and what I've really learned, I guess, is things are really never um, as bad or as good as they seem. Uh, and that it's really important to kind of control your emotional response uh, to, to the external environment and just stay focused on what it is you're trying to do um, and what what are the objectives of the organization. Um, and again, as a leader, you know, it's really important to, to try to maintain a bit of an even keel, right? Because people look to you to see how, how you know, how, how the business is going, how, how, how are we performing? Uh, people, people really do look to the guy in my seat to say, okay, you know, if, if the CEO's, you know, on a roller coaster and it's really apparent, then that, that can be off-putting or, or, you know, can put, can scare people, right? Basically. Um, so, yeah, I've learned, I guess I've learned to try to maintain at least outwardly uh, the appearance of, of uh, kind of an even keel. Uh, so, but it's a constant challenge. I mean, I think we're all human beings and we all, we all, regardless of, of what you do for a living or what your role is, uh, we all have the, the same kind of, um, I think mental ups and downs. Right. And, and so, so anyway, I can say that's probably the primary thing that I've, I've learned over the time. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank thank you very much for sharing. And uh, my last question for you then, uh, David, again, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on today. Really appreciate your time. Um, last question. I always like to ask this one because I think, we, you know, for anyone who, who views this, you know, who's looking to go into, um, who's looking to go into any sort of business venture for themselves, um, if they've got a great idea or something, you know, but maybe they're just... Um, they're just not pushing themselves to do it. You know, what advice would you give that person or uh, again, anyone who's just got a, an idea, but is just sitting on the fence and maybe not taking any action, any advice that you would give to any, that person who's looking to go into business then for themselves? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think there's been many things said about this right over, over time. And I'm not sure that I have a really many unique ideas in this regard i think you, you need to just do it right that's kind of a nike you need to do it don't be afraid to make a mistake don't be afraid to fail you have to do that i mean i think you know i read something years ago and it's, it's a famous saying i forgot i don't know who said it but do the thing you fear and the death of fear is certain right and i think that's what i would the advice i would give is think about yourself in 10 or 15 years from now how will you feel if you had a great idea and you didn't do anything about it and you see you know, somebody else took your idea and ran with it, right? How do you feel about that? And what I would also say is if you do something and you fail, and chances are you will, right? Chances are you will. It's a, there's a, you, know, you will learn much more about yourself and about the world and, and about life by taking that risk. And I think... Um, I think ultimately, if you if you want to challenge yourself, if you really want to live life to its fullest, you have to take risks. If you don't take risks, if you don't challenge yourself, you don't grow as an individual. Um, and I think today it's particularly important because we have so many things that are so distracting, and it's so easy just to sit on the on the couch and swipe, you know, you know, on your Instagram, the infinite scroll on Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is. I think it's so easy to be really distracted um, and and it's easy to sit on the couch and not take that risk. So I would just really encourage anybody who's got an idea, you know, just go into the fear, take the risk, take the chance, do it. If it doesn't work out, at least you're going to learn uh, and you'll learn. And then, you know, change, most if you look at the statistics, most people, you know, they usually don't succeed in their first business venture. Most, you know, typically, you know, there it may take multiple tries before you you ultimately succeed. Um, so, so again, but it, you learn a lot about yourself, and it's it's worth the journey. Yeah, absolutely. 
<laughs> some brilliant pieces of advice there, you know. You know, just do it, you know, learn learn from mistakes. Uh, you know, don't be afraid of failure. There was lots of great things there, David, that you said that well, you know, I think again, if anyone's watching this, you know, we'll take that on board and go for it, you know, because that is that was that was the first thing you said. Just do it, you know, just right. do it. Absolutely. Right. So, David, no, thank you very much. That was a great answer. So, thank you so much for that, and thank you very much for this interview. It's been it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, David. Okay, Mark. Thank you as well for having me. Have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. Um, thank you very much for watching Business Spotlight. I'm Mark Hunter of Action Coach, and we've had David Wither of Sofan Technologies. Thanks very much. We'll see you next time. Bye now.